bought my 3.8 fixed head in April and received it in August 1963. And it's got a very appropriate number plate. Yow! <laughs> goes with the sound of an E-type. In the early 60s, John Strube was an architect driving the length and breadth of Britain. He bought his E-Type, capable of 150 miles an hour, because he thought it would make him a safer driver than he was in his previous car. I'd been driving long distances in an old Woolsey, and I dozed off one day down in Sussex and ran into a hedge. And I thought, well, I must get something more exciting to drive, and the E-Type was the answer. Despite its seamless appearance, the E-Type was a typically British collection of bits and pieces. Its smooth, sleek body was an elongated steel version of the racing D-Type, created by aircraft aerodynamicist Malcolm Sayer. With its superb handling and driver comfort, it had no real rival when unveiled at the Geneva Motor Show in 1961. It became one of Britain's great export successes. Only Aston Martins matched its performance, but they could not match its price. Well, the cost was about 1,800 and something, with a hundred pound deposit. A little more expensive than the average car. In fact, many of my clients thought they were paying me too much in fees when they saw me arriving at an E-Type. <laughs> I felt rather hesitant at driving it at first because it was so powerful compared to anything else I'd driven. One had plenty of acceleration in those days compared to other cars. <laughs> and uh, everyone made way for you. As soon as they saw you in the mirror, you know, they moved over. They don't do that now. I remember distinctly driving on the extension of the M1 at 120 without a car in sight. That was before the speed limit, of course. I liked all the acceleration, the envious glances from other drivers. <laughs> the E-Type was by no means the first successful British sports car. Morris Garages, based in Abingdon, had been manufacturing sports cars since the 1920s. Over the decades, they'd built a reputation for traditional quality. During the Second World War, American servicemen discovered what the British had known all along, that driving could be fun, and GIs took back more than just their war brides. After the war, one particular MG model was exported to America more than any other. It was the car which ignited foreign interest in British sports cars, even though it was really only a slightly modified version of pre-war MGs. The MG TC was unashamedly retro, even in 1945, but it offered thrills at an affordable price. I bought this car, which was my first car, in the late summer of 1959. I'd always been passionately interested in sports cars as a young man, and I saw this car advertised there. And I went and saw it, and it was a wreck, but I fell in love with it. I then went and saw my bank manager and asked him to lend me some money, <laughs> which he very kindly did. The wind and the hair and the adrenaline flow associated with it was wonderful for me as a young man. And I noticed that it didn't stop very well, but I chose to ignore that because I didn't want to stop, I wanted it to go. Of course, one of the beauties of this car 
which is basically a 1930s car, and it feels like it, is that if you're doing 50 miles an hour in this car, you feel as if you're flying and doing the turn. It's absolutely tremendous fun. It is built in the vintage tradition, which means it has narrow tyres, very little suspension movement, and therefore at anything over about 30 miles an hour, you're not really in contact with the road very often, which makes it exciting. It is an immensely chuckable car. You can fling it into corners, but because of the steering, it's only one and a half turns lock to lock, you can easily catch it and keep it under control. Under the square bonnet was the same 1250cc engine which powered pre-war MGs. It took the car from 0 to 60 in a leisurely 23 seconds. When I bought it, it was black. But when I actually eventually did rebuild this car, I decided that whilst black was smart, it was probably a bit of a pedestrian colour. And this was a fun car, so I wanted a fun colour. My wife knew damn well before she married me that the car was there to stay and was very much my first wife. That was all understood and uh, almost part of the marriage contract. And so uh, we've been together longer than I've been married. But the TC's post-war supremacy wasn't to last. A new breed of designers were developing a new breed of cars. But while Triumph was scooping the awards, MG was still living in the past. The British Motor Corporation management had trapped MG in the 30s, instructing them to design further T-types, preserving MG's dated public image. But MG's designers wanted to enter the modern world. They continued to experiment with a string of radical designs. And in 1953, they were finally given the go-ahead to produce this groundbreaking sports car. Here was a car to compete head-on with Heelys and Triumphs. The MGA was lighter and sleeker than the Healy 100 and with a cleaner line than the TR2. But the MG engineers had a plan to make the car even better. They took up the challenge of modifying their standard pushrod engine to produce a double overhead camshaft mechanism, the twin cam. This complex engine would power the next generation of MGAs, and the EX181 experimental car, driven by Sterling Moss, was the means of displaying the twin cam's capabilities to MG's traditionalist market. In August 1957, the little projectile sailed from Southampton on the Queen Mary, bound for Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah, America. Incidentally, the choice of an American location for the world record attempt means that if all goes well, the MG Special will capture the corresponding American records as well. National titles may be less important than world ones, but all the same, they would be a feather in Britain's cap in view of the present keen international competition and the importance of the American market to Britain's motor industry. The officials are in their places. The timing equipment is ready. Conditions are perfect. And Moss is away. The aim was to smash the speed record for cars within the 1500cc category. On the evening of the 23rd of August, Sterling Moss and the EX181 broke five international speed records. They reached over 245 miles an hour. MGA first came out, I was a schoolboy, uh, back in 1955, and on the way home I had to pass Smarts, the MG dealers, and my friend and I would stop, look in Smarts window, push our noses up against the glass and say, I wish I could have one of those, and that was an MGA. 
and I continued that dream on until much later in life when I finally realized the ambition and actually bought one. I like the lines of the car. It is significantly more powerful than the ordinary pushrod car and whilst it's not tremendously faster, it feels a lot faster because of the noises it makes and the way it handles. The MGA was a considerable improvement over the T-types. MGA is much more sophisticated, much more modern in its general design of its suspension. A lot quicker, much, much more comfortable. Better seats, better interior, better cockpit. The MGA has what's called a neutral handling car. It does exactly what you want it to do. If you put it into a corner, it goes round the corner. It doesn't ever go straight on when you want it to go around. Very safe in cornering, doesn't understeer, doesn't oversteer. You basically have control of the car the whole time. Every MG is a car for the enthusiast, but the twin cam is for the enthusiast who demands just that little extra. The best sort of person to drive in a twin cam is probably someone with a little more sense than the sort of people who used to buy them. In the early days, the cars were generally bought or quite often bought either as shopping cars for rich men's wives or as uh, sports cars for rich men's sons. The, the publicity said it did 115 miles an hour, so it had to do 115 miles an hour, which it would do as long as everything was set up just right. But the twin cam engine was notoriously temperamental and the crucial American market was becoming more intolerant of unreliability. Devil May Care British sports cars were up against totally reliable, if characterless, foreign cars. They came under further pressure from increasingly tough American safety legislation. Jaguar tried to adapt its E-Type by raising its roofline and bumpers, but the ungainly result did nothing for the car's image. The last E-Type rolled off the production line in 1974. The end of a long line of successful exports from an era when British sports cars were dominant.